partic uh, uh, participants, viewer, audience to really please go on mute if you're not speaking. I see some people here. Uh, Dr. Devanji, can you put yourself on the mute, please? And, yes. and others? Yeah, everyone else? Uh, okay. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for putting yourself on mute. Um, Okay, so um, welcome to the Global Health Vision Lecture Series of National Eye Institute. I'm John Prakash uh, from the Office of uh, Inter International Program Activities, and I just want to welcome um, all of you. Uh, we have, uh, looks like, have uh, started uh, in, in real time uh, working out of our conference room at uh, National Eye Institute, uh, you know, after uh, uh, the pandemic, uh, after two years. So it is my great uh, honor to welcome uh, Professor S. Natarajan. Um, you saw a very impressive bio. And uh, Professor Natarajan is uh, not a stranger for National Eye Institute. He's been uh, an old collaborator and he's been working with us on uh, many programs, many projects. One of the most notable program is that uh, National Eye Institute initiative uh, with Tokyo Medical Center called uh, the Global Eye Genetics Consortium. And Dr. Natarajan is the um, Secretary General for the Global Eye, Eye Genetics Consortium. In addition, he's worked with us on uh, a number of uh, uh, programs uh, that relates to uh, the Asian societies and uh, societies, uh, uh, ophthalmic societies in India, and uh, as well as the um, ICO, International Council of Ophthalmology, uh, where he is uh, on the board of directors. So it is a great honor and privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Natarajan. I recall uh, many, many years ago, actually, I had seen this movie called Slumdog Millionaire from Bollywood. Many of you, uh, I'm assuming, <laughs> seen the movie Slumdog Millionaire. And um, when I watched the movie, this was obviously many years ago, uh, I, I had thought that, you know, this is, this is a great uh, place to do public health study, global health study, things related to biomedical research. And then, uh, and this was a, a, a Hollywood production combined with Bollywood production. So I'm just getting down to some interesting uh, facts. So that's what I thought. And then uh, a few months later, I attended a presentation and met Dr. Natarajan. And, uh, and, and then later on, uh, you know, I happened to be in that uh, part of the world and learned that uh, Dr. Natarajan is the person who is actually working, doing there and has a clinic and studying diabetic retinopathy. And I said, you know, what a great opportunity. So uh, what we have is we want to hear the story, how he got started, how he, what he views as, uh, you know, um, this disease, diabetic retinopathy, which is like a, 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 in terms of prevalence, it's a huge, uh, it's a very large prevalence worldwide, more than um, half a billion people. And uh, so we're going to learn from him about the past, present and future, and especially someone in his role who has not only done the groundwork and is working really, as we say, that uh, in the trenches, uh, in, the, in the slums uh, of the largest slums of the world in Mumbai, Dharavi and Gawandi and so on. So I'm really excited uh, and it is a great, great uh, pleasure on behalf of uh, uh, the NEI director, Dr. Michael Chang, who unfortunately could not be here today. And on behalf of everyone at uh, National Eye Institute, it's a great uh, honor to welcome Professor S. Natarajan. Um, he received uh, the fourth highest uh, civilian honor by the president of India. And we are very pleased to have him. So I'm gonna turn it to Dr. Natarajan and my technical staff will help me, I guess. Thank so you. thank you so much. Should I tell this? Yeah. 
So just, so just one, one more, one more, more thing, thing that, that uh, we are recording, recording this session. session. And, and if, if you, you have, have any, any objections, objections to, uh, we'll, I would really ask you to log off at this point. point. Uh, the, uh, session the session is being recorded, being recorded for future use. Uh, so uh, please stay, stay on, on if, you, uh, if you're giving recording in to, progress. Uh, have this session recorded. Thank, Thank you, so you so much. much. Introduction to Thank you, John. And, uh, and it's a great pleasure to be here in NEINS again, and I'm also bring greetings from India. Thank you, John, and uh, sorry for the little uh, the computer hitch. And I'm going to talk on the diabetes retinopathy past, present, future, and its uh, implication to the global health. So there are, these are my affiliations. I'm just uh, the main thing is about I'm the president of Daily Ophthalmic uh, Society of India, and my dream is to uh, prevent diabetic blindness. And I do not have any affiliation. Uh, financial or otherwise with a commercial organization that may have a direct or indirect connection to the content of my presentation. So for this I just want to try it. So I just want to give a brief introduction of the diabetic retinopathy uh, for the, uh, uh, so I wanted to say the eye is the window of the body and artificial intelligence to prevent diabetic blindness. So this is just to show the cross section of the eye and the eye works like a, a camera and you have the, all the images going onto the retina and then conveyed to the op op brain to the optic nerve and the vision is the function of the uh, brain. And this is how the normal retina roots. And then the, you have the, when they have the exudates and hemorrhages happening, diabetic retinopathy happens. So diabetes is a disease that occurs when your blood glucose, also called blood sugar is too high. And blood glucose is your main source of energy and comes from the food you eat. So the, these are the risk factors for the diabetes, the duration of diabetes, the poor control, pregnancy, hypertension, nephropathy, hyperlipidemia, smoking, cataract surgery, anemia, and obesity. So this is the clinical feature which shows the hemorrhages, abnormal close blood vessels, aneurysm, cotton wool spot, hard exudates, and that's how the diabetic retina happens. And this shows the normal retina of the fundus photograph of the normal retina, the early stage, a more mild, moderate, non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, mild stage severe versus non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, late stage proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and complicated state which gets bleed and complicated and you also have the retinal detachment. The reason I'm showing all this is to uh, mean is to see that if you do prevention, you uh, these sort of uh, blindness may not occur, and you have the sight threatening traction retinal detachment, non clearing vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, then you have combined tractional and regmatogenous retinal detachment, uh, the taut posterior hyaloid, the uh, here are the reduced xyridus, which is hemorrhage. The reason I'm showing this is even today, we have 25,000 ophthalmologists and we have several excellent eye hospitals, but still we have patients getting these things. We also have to do in investigations like fluorescent angiography, diabetic, showing the diabetic macular edema, the traction retinal detachment, rubius xyridus, neovascular glaucoma, and these are the various stages of a, a clinically significant macular edema, now termed as diabetic macular edema. You see the new blood vessel which is growing in on the surface of retina and into the vitreous. So the, this shows the high-risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy, 
very severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and rubiosis still in our part of the world, laser is the uh, standard of care for treatment of proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And in the Western world, we are now going into the anti-vascular endothelial growth factor. So still in India, we do panel photorelation as a standard care and everything costs. And these are the various anti-vascular endothelial growth factor injections and uh, uh, steroid implant, which are required for treating diabetic macular edema. And in, in spite of all this, if, you, if the patient goes in the next complication, they go to vitreous hemorrhage, and then you have to do surgery. Like as you see here, there's all this costs uh, 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 enormous uh, uh, to the patient and to the uh, state the government and the central government. So the, the idea is that I'm just showing that all can be done, but uh, my, I'm just going back to my... So just, so just, so just that uh, it starts as a normal eye and then goes into the severe uh, uh, diabetic uh, blindness. So as I mentioned, diabetic affects many organ systems of the body, including the eye. Effect on the retinal vasculature causes microvascular angiopathy and leads to vascular leakage of serum and blood, ultimately proliferation of microvasculature in the late stage of diabetic retinopathy. And diabetic retinopathy was first reported perhaps by Apollinaire Bokshard. And uh, diabetes is about 463 million. By 2045, it'll rise to 700 million. And India has about 77 million. One in six adults with diabetes in the world come from India. And epidemiological studies have shown that one in three persons with diabetes have diabetic retinopathy, and one in 10 have sight threatening diabetic retinopathy, as published in the International Diabetic Federation. And this so country wise, you can see that China, India, unfortunately, India will soon rise to number one, which is uh, we are not happy about it, but we have to know the facts, and followed by US, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, Russia, Egypt, Germany, Pakistan. So here you see how hypertension produces hemodynamic stress and uh, the, uh, the diabetes produces glucotoxicity and lipid uh, uh, rise produces lipotoxicity, finally producing oxidative stress, hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, inflammation. And you have the MTO or active overactivation producing tissue damage because of hypoxia, angiogenesis, proliferation, fibrosis, apto apoptosis, and microvascular complication happens in the renal diabetic nephropathy and retina, the diabetic retinopathy. And I am again showing you the normal retina as well as the various stages of diabetic retinopathy. So the first seminal event in developing a medical and clinical understanding of diabetic retinopathy came with the invention of ophthalmoscope by Hermann von Helmholtz in 1851 and allowed physicians to directly view ocular fundus to observe the integrity of blood vessels. And uh, American Society for Retina Specialists have made a Retina Hall of Fame from 1851 to 2016, and it's there in the website. And uh, so the fundus fluorescent angiography was one of the early investigations started in the 1960s, which shows that we inject a dye in the vein, and you can take photographs of the retina. The dark spots show the, the capillary dropout area, and the white spot shows the, the increased hyperfluorescent, indicating there's a new blood vessel because the of anexia the new, new blood was grow. So the second stage began in 1970s with a series of interventional treatment that began with panretinal photocoagulation. And panretinal photocoagulation remains the mainstay of medical treatment for ocular components of advanced diabetes in most part of the world, except the Western world. And this led to the pioneering large-scale ophthalmic clinical trial, termed the Diabetic Retinopathy Study, initiated in 1970s. Thanks again uh, in the US. This randomized controlled trial enrolled approximately 1,700 patients with advanced proliferative retinopathy eyes were randomized to receive photocoagulation and the fellow control eyes were followed but not treated. A greater than 50% risk reduction for progression to severe vision loss was found for eyes treated with panretinal argon laser or xenon arc photocoagulation. So they, this is a uh, clinical trial for diabetic retinopathy then shifted to controlling the underlying diabetes to learn whether this lessened the risk of vision impairment from diabetic retinopathy. The first of these trials were launched in 1983, the Diabetes Control and Complication Trial called the DCCT. 
the epidemiology of diabetes intervention and complication trial and the United Kingdom prospective diabetes study. These studies demonstrate a tight control of diabetes reduced diabetic complication, particularly when stratified by maintaining a hemoglobin A1C value of 7% or less. And this was associated with substantial reduction in progress of retinopathy. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, many 99% um, of the patients do not have a tight control. So hence, diabetes control does not mean just normal control, you would have a tight control. So whatever people call diabetes control will not control the retinopathy. The, con the conventional, uh, the 54% reduction in retinopathy progression, 47% reduction in proliferative diabetic retinopathy, 56% reduction in photocoagulation, and 23% reduction in macular edema. So my medical management of diabetic retinopathy includes overall metabolic control, glycemic control, control of blood pressure, dyslipidemia, and other coexisting medical problems. And that's why it will cross a huge exchequer to the government if uh, we don't do uh, early screening. And uh, the diabetic uh, cellular level and molecular level, we have now entered a third phase, which heralds the future based on biologic intervention at the molecular level. Success of the molecular approach was gathered speed in the last decade as we began to understand the pathology at a cellular and system biology level. My mentor's mentor, Charles Kippens, once when he visited me in 93 in Mumbai, asked me, can you prevent diabetic retinopathy? And at that time, I said, how is it possible? But now I think there are possibilities by doing various cellular level and we can do. So we also need investigations where we, we have this uh, optical coherent tomography, which shows various macular edema, vitreo macular traction, and diabetic retinopathy clinical research network started in the US, DRCR.net. This quickly led to consideration of anti vegf treatment for diabetic macular edema, and a study was begun, which ran from 2007 to 2010. The study design completed a ranibuzumab treatment with or without immediate laser was a laser retinal photographation with or without concomitant intraocular steroid. And uh, anti of treatment provided clear benefit compared to laser treatment with improvement of visual acuity compared to laser treatment. That's why I mentioned, even though this is the finding and this is what is being followed in the Western world, the rest of the world is still a laser is the mainstay because anti we have to give every month and it costs to the patient or to the government and fewer eyes suffered visual impairment compared to laser treatment. So there are various, I don't have any financial interest. We have various ranimuzumab, aflibrisib, bevacizumab, and we also have the uh, uh, biosimilars and uh, many, and this you can see the comparison of uh, anti vegf and uh, laser. And this is the, again, the complication where we have neovacillation of uh, optic disc, neovacillation elsewhere, pre-retinal hybrid over the macula, and if you still don't treat uh, traction retinal detachment. The crude prevalence of visual impairment and blindness caused by diabetic retinopathy worldwide increased between 1990 and 2015, largely because of increasing prevalence of type 2 diabetes, particularly low-income and middle-income countries. So screening for diabetic retinopathy is essential to detect preferable cases that need timely, full ophthalmic examination and treatment to avoid permanent vision loss. And that's what I want to drive at at a standing here in NEI and NIH. The new technologies such as scanning for uh, confocal ophthalmology with the ultra-wide field imaging and handheld mobile devices, tele-ophthalmology for remote grading and AI for automated detection and classification of diabetic retinopathy are changing screening strategies and improving cost effectiveness. And uh, uh, recruitment strategies of diabetic retinopathy for uh, diabetic retinopathy camp. We have an estimated one half of the diabetic population does not receive annual dilated eye examination. Late stage treatment is also enormously expensive if the patient is going to pay from his pocket or a, the government is going to pay for it. So we need for diabetic retinopathy screening, the diabetic retinopathy camps, the general hospital, uh, the counters, the local NGOs, diabetologists, household elimination of diabetics. And the current screening strategies aimed at detection of diabetic retinopathy have poor compliance. Screening modalities can vary according to instrument used, example, film, Polaroid, scanning laser, or digital photography, set lamp, direct and indirect ophthalmoscope, mediatic status, number of photographic fields, and qualification of the photographer and interpreter. The need for photography depends on the equipment, which can be cost prohibitive for many systems. Mobile programs help solve the geographic access problem, for, but equipment cost remains prohibitive for routine providers and communities that are not supported by governments or foundations. 
you have the tabletop fundus camera, the ultrawide field fundus camera, and also we can take smartphone and use it as an ophthalmoscope for taking photograph. So the evolution of daily screening for diabetic retinopathy, this ophthalmologist based model was converted to ophthalmologist led model or optometrist based model, mobile vans, vision centers, diabetic centers, and many of our, our four field fundus photography to single field photography from mediatic to non mediatic camera, teleconnectivity from the earlier in India, they used the Indian Space Research Organization, satellite connectivity to internet connectivity now to mobile phones and methods for diabetic retinopathy, telescreening from store and forward to real time teleconsultations. And I think during COVID, many of this has been done and the leaders are uh, Shankar Netralaya and Aravinda Hospital and to some extent the Hospital in Mumbai. So again, in DR screening, we want to take photographs like this, send it to the either reading center or use the AI. And I have a video, I don't have any financial interest. This is a mobile phone attached to a infrared device made by an Indian company called Remedio, where you have an um, infrared device advice attached to a mobile phone. That's an iPhone and there's a software and you can see there, the, the you can take a photograph and there's a media software you place the image there, the, the, it has a built-in that the blue part shows that uh, the AI detects the abnormality in the retina, particularly in the diabetic retinopathy. And that if you put, it says referable diabetic retinopathy or non-referable. If it is referable, it refers to the diabetic, the retina specialist. So the whole idea is that these patients where we have trained in India, uh, school dropouts who can be trained and uh, uh, we can call, I call them ABCD. That means anybody can screen for diabetic retinopathy. So here we did this. We have uh, optometrists, technicians, and also the boys uh, from school dropout who are using the camera. We came in the Guinness record. The idea is not for record. The idea, we want many people to break this record. The idea is we could, we could prove that we can, we collected 2000 diabetic patients. And I also represent uh, an NGO called Roti Bank where we give free food to the uh, poor people every day about 11,000. And my friend Shivanandan runs it. So we collected and we gave diabetic food to these patients in the slums, which uh, our John Prakash introduced the slum dog millionaire where still the, uh, the people live in a very filthy area, but we decided to, because of my grandfather and father who come from uh, the government of uh, Tamil Nadu. And that's where I was born as an ophthalmologist. So I'm giving back to the society by organizing this. So we came, we collected 2000 patients, 1000 patients were screened. We did also the HB1AC and then we took photograph of 649 patients in eight hours. And then about 58 of them needed uh, uh, treatment, which we did free. And we also, as a president of All India Ophthalmic Society, I know this is going to have, what a, uh, I hope this will have a global impact because I have given similar lectures all over the world, including NEI. My dream is to create this program called Screening Through Teleophthalmology to Prevent Diabetic Blindness. In, the, in India, our prime minister is uh, uh, very happy to give a Hindi slogan called Jot Se Jot Jalao. That means lighting one candle to another candle so that you, you can screen everybody. And this acronym was coined by the former foundation uh, CEO of Radhika Krishnan. And uh, diabetic retinopathy, the future. So John asked me that why not to give a talk. So I, I'm taking this talk as a, uh, and a homework for myself as a crusader against blindness. We have, uh, we had Dr. Ravengar Sami, who's a legend, who was a great uh, supporter of, of NEI when Dr. Carl Kupfer times. And then we have Dr. Badinath, who's also currently there is a uh, Indo-American project going on. So the reason is I have taken that mantle that uh, we, in the future, we should be able to set up an example for screening the entire country. We, we have 77 million diabetics. And I'll, I'll be showing you a paper which was just published yesterday in JAMA uh, by the group from Moorfields and Shankar and Arvind. So not all individuals with long-standing diabetes progress to diabetic retinopathy. That's a good news, but uh, it's not that good because 25% may go, but 25% may not go. But to get that 25%, we have to screen so many millions. And a recent meta-analysis of 35 population-based studies of diabetes worldwide indicates that about one third of diabetic individuals have some degree of diabetic retinopathy and fewer than 10% have either diabetic macular edema or proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which is called the site-threatening diabetic retinopathy. 
and a substantial number of individuals with underlying diabetes do not progress to overt diabetic retinopathy. One pathway is through the use of molecular genetics to identify factors that contribute risk for conversion from diabetes to diabetic retinopathy. And that's where the NEI and IH is playing a very important role in, in, in the world. And the smartphone fundus camera with AI, I, I don't know who did it first, and we are one of the one who used the offline AI, which is very good for countries like uh, Thailand, India, Africa, uh, entire Africa, and and uh, South America, where where internet has, a, even though uh, in India we have promise has given, and also Sundar Pichai from Google has given uh, uh, Wi-Fi and internet free for many places, but still we have problems. So we designed this and we have published this in JAMA in uh, August uh, 19, which was a well-read article that time, where uh, we evaluated the performance of another offline smartphone-based AI system for the detection of referable diabetic retinopathy by using the images taken by the same smartphone. And we have used uh, uh, school dropouts to do that. And we are doing that daily, thanks to the Ta Ratan Tata, the philanthropist from India, who gave the initial funding of a, 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 a huge money to do that in the slums of Mumbai. The sensitivity and specificity in diagnosing any diabetic retinopathy were 85 and 92% respectively compared with the ophthalmologist grading. And uh, recently, this was published about three days back, uh, again in a reputed journal. The, uh, it's, in the, uh, uh, it's in the eye in 2018, uh, where it assesses the role of an AI system for detection of diabetic retinopathy and sight threatening diabetic retinopathy using smartphone based retinal imaging system in 2018 and validated against grading by ophthalmologists. The AI system actually uh, achieved 96% sensitivity and 80% specificity in detecting any diabetic retinopathy, 99% sensitivity and 80% specificity in detecting sight threatening diabetic retinopathy. And this is the American daily ophthalmology guidelines for. Uh, uh, AI for diabetic retinopathy, the system that identifies patients with none or very mild non proliferative diabetic retinopathy, the system that identifies patients with or without sight threatening diabetic retinopathy, the system that identifies non proliferative diabetic retinopathy, proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and macular edema with sufficient accuracy for appropriate decision making, and the system that equals or exceeds the ability of the ETDRS photograph to identify diabetic retinopathy lesions. Despite these promising early indications of genetic association, and this is the future again, identifying genes strongly associated with diabetic retinopathy has proven difficult. This may stem from several factors. Perhaps each gene makes only a small contribution that segments the risks and thereby requires a large number of cases for genetic analysis. Other factors complicating the gene search would include diverse clinical features at different stages of disease progression. An environmental component is actually so large that it swamps the genetic depart det determinants. So at this juncture, I would like to say that I'm happy. Uh, Alvin Liu, uh, consultant from uh, the Johns Hopkins uh, in, a, in an American Academy of Ophthalmology program in 2019, uh, mentioned that using smartphone and AI, offline AI will be the future. But I'm happy to say even in 2019, we were doing it currently. But whatever I'm doing with my team is a drop in ocean for preventing diabetic retinopathy. So I have a homework to everybody who's watching this and who are going to watch in the future in the recording. The thing is, I think everybody should do something to prevent diabetic blindness. So I have made a mission called Diabetic Blind Free India by 2025. And one of the things I'm advising everybody in India is to, which uh, they say, now that I'm going to show you a presentation from uh, but a group Ornate India, which I'm also part, Dr. Rajiv Raman has uh, published that along with Shobhashio Prasad in uh, ophthalmology, in uh, JAMA ophthalmology yesterday. So rationale of exploring blood-based biomarker, vision diabetic retinopathy is a silent disease until late complication. Okay, that's the biggest problem because the patients don't know that they're going to go blind. And the standard screening for vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy is by color fundus photography and regular retinal cameras are expensive and grading retinal photographs to identify vision threatening diabetic retinopathy needs expertise. And there are over 537 million people with diabetes in the world and annual retinal screening for every person with diabetes is not feasible. This is what the group has concluded, which is published yesterday on May 5th in JAMA of Salmology. A new approach to identifying vision threatening diabetic retinopathy is required. And I agree that uh, it looks uh, not feasible, but uh, 
I think uh, we had uh, uh, people like Nelson Mandela in this world where uh, in spite of uh, he was in the, in the jail for 27 years, he did something for the country. So I think there is a possibility and that's what is the power of one and that's what I'm taking it. And I want to appeal here that uh, even though it's not feasible, we should make it. I'm glad they have made a, a, a diagnostic circulating biomarkers to detect vision threatening diabetic retinopathy, potential screening tool of the future. So I'm glad that even though when I when I was asked to give this talk, this was not there because it was only published yesterday. And uh, and I, I'm happy that uh, in, I'm standing here in NAI, not only talking about screening, which may it may not come under the NAI, NAI NIH, but this uh, biomarker, and that's where the Indo-American grant, what uh, uh, the NIH is doing, NAI is doing, is great contribution to the world. So can we use a pre-screening approach for diabetic retinopathy in India? That's what this Ornate India, which was designed by a fund from uh, UK, uh, headed by Shobha Shobha, about 6 million pounds, where to screen all people with diabetes, retinal photograph for those who are positive for biomarker. We had 20 institutions from India and ma major uh, institutes were uh, Arvindai Hospital and uh, Shankar So the take home message from the paper, a pre-screening strategy with cystatin C will identify screen threatening diabetic retinopathy quickly than screening everyone using retinal cameras. But I'm actually aiming at screening everybody. And then I want to screen everybody from the age of 30 in India at least. And that's why I'm meeting all the health ministers in India. Health is a state subject. So it's like a mini Europe. We have 31 states and about 10 uh, territories, union territories, we have to address them. So I'm addressing the governors, I'm addressing the municipal commissioners, the union health minister and so on. And I think uh, it will be a crusade. I have made it a five-year program and I hope uh, Vision 2020 was started in the 80s by saying that uh, everybody in year 2020 will have right to sight and right eye and left eye individually will have 20 by 20. I know we have not achieved that, but there are several programs, the IAPB took it up WHO has taken it up, and so I think that blindness rate is going down. So I think that this is one of the contribution by Dr. Rajiv Raman and group. Thanks to Dr. Rajiv for sending me these slides. The high HPM AC is the most important risk factor for diabetic retinopathy and sight threatening diabetic retinopathy. So we are doing, and that again needs funding, and that's why I'm going to use this to appeal to the whole world that whoever is working on diabetes. That means the diabetic pharmaceuticals, diabetic research group to look into it. And so that every diabetic should be screened, teach them at the young age of 30 to 35, when they're going to get diabetes on either because of wrong food or because of uh, no exercise, sedentary work, and uh, also no, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, all if they are family history. And with this, all this uh, biomarker, I think we will be going, uh, taking the healthcare to the doorstep. And I hope we can do the, uh, the whole world and the whole world uh, should live well, happily and healthily. And that's the idea of this talk. Implementation of validated risk models to identify people at risk of strike that means diabetic retinopathy will facilitate universal, universal screening coverage. And this is the group which has worked. Thanks to them for lending me the slides. So the uh, major threat to global health the World Health Organization estimated that the total number of people with diabetes will double from 171 million to 2000 uh, to uh, 366 million by 2030. So uh, the number of uh, diabetic retinopathy and vision threatening diabetic retinopathy, which includes that uh, the short form VTDR and uh, earlier it was STDR, includes severe non proliferative diabetic retinopathy proliferative diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema has been estimated to rise to 191 million and 56.3 million respectively by 2030. And diabetic retinopathy accounts for 4.8% of the number of cases of blindness, uh, 37 million worldwide. And diabetic retinopathy were ranked the fifth most common cause of blindness and moderate to severe vision loss. 32.4 million blind and 191 million visually impaired 0.8 million people uh, were blind and an additional 3.7 million were visually impaired due to diabetic retinopathy. So you can see the human burden that uh, it is one of the leading vision class and uh, this uh, shows the economic burden and the future burden all in uh, millions of dollars. And I think if we can do screening, we can get the most economical way of screening and plus we give a healthy life to a, an individual when he's in this planet and also teach him exercise, teach him 
uh, oral antidiabetics and and also to eat the proper food and thereby he can be protective for himself his family his town his state and the country so effectively tackle diabetic retinopathy at a global level primary prevention improve awareness lifestyle changes medications to control risk factors systematic screening for early detection of retinopathy and this is the numbers you are seeing secondary prevention medications to control risk factors regular screening for uh, mo to monitor for progression of diabetic retinopathy policies guidelines for managing diabetic retinopathy i hope whoever is uh, involved in this to make a policy to do their own uh, place so that uh, they will uh, they can serve their country tertiary pre prevention ocular treatment laser anti wedge of novel agents visual rehabilitation and that's the idea of this presentation so that i am an aggressive veteran surgeon and i am in the uh, in the you know, one of the uh, more, more, the most number of veteran surgeon and now coming into public health ophthalmology because i know that uh, we can only do few surgeries a day but if you can screen millions a day with you know, without doctors without technicians i think we will be able to uh, make a healthy living and viewing diabetes and uh, diabetic retinopathy across several millennia provides a perspective of our current unique position in biologic history i hope i have covered the present pre the past present and future and medicine has clearly begun to study disease pathophysiology at the cellular level and that's what the nihni is doing and to intervene with knowledge of how the biological system is failing at a systems level and many of these techniques and biologic insights come only with years of scientific training and years of carefully developed research methodologies and the future will require increased collaborative interaction between basic scientists and clinical investigators to build a strong platform that supports clinical research and i am grateful i am a long time member of uh, a ro and i am glad the ro is a great uh, platform and I, at this uh, juncture i met uh, dr john prakash in hong kong in a meeting and i think uh, it really stimulated my interest in uh, i was doing research but a very but primitive and i'm glad he has in enthused uh, the the passion for doing research and uh, i look young but i'm i'm a, i'm a lo looks like a post retirement but my thing is to do research and prevent diabetic blindness so diabetic retinopathy is a global epidemic that needs significant innovative solution as well as na national and international strategies in india we have a term called jugaad that means uh, you do something out of the box thinking to do uh, um, and uh, the the harvard says knowing doing gap everybody knows that you have to screen and prevent but it's not happening and effective implementation of primary and secondary prevention strategies has the potential uh, to significantly reduce diabetic blindness and heads of the state and government i hope i they can see this presentation committed to develop ambitious national responses by 2030 to reduce by one third premature mortality from ncds through ncd is a non communicable disease to prevention and treatment india has taken ncd seriously but the problem is they are only talking about diabetes not the complications which affects the brain eye uh, the kidney uh, foot and uh, uh, so i want to quote my friend uh, the late uh, president of india dr abdul kalam innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower so i want everybody who's listening to this and who's going to watch anyone who converts a challenge into an opportunity through innovation creates wealth he or she indeed is a leader and i hope i can stimulate you inspire you like him to be a leader and uh, not just a follower and do this and i at this i want to publicly acknowledge the inputs given by my youngest scientist with me aparna followed by shivani they both are msc not doctors the most of the 95% of them they took this because i'm traveling for the last one week and i decided doing this and also thanks to dr asta jain doctor consultant with me dr sheila john is here who is from shankar netralaya dr rajiv raman dr radhika krishnan who is a former in the foundation and many others my foundation who uh, i'm happy to stimulate them to work for the global uh, uh, prevention of diabetic blindness thank you very much for thank the opportunity you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. And I'm open for questions. questions and you can start the comments. Let me just make it. Let me get the sound check. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Rajan, thank you so much. Uh, let me just make a quick correction here, as I said in the earlier. Um, 
introduction, introducing you. And, uh, yeah, we do, you know, looking at the global number, I think, I mean, what I'm getting right now from, from you is certainly more than half of a billion people, more than 500 million people um, who have like confirmed diabetes, but close to 200 million people are confirmed or expected to have diabetic, right? So just one clarification. Okay. So about, about 500 million confirmed diabetics, about 190, 92 million people have diabetic right now. Okay. So that's, that's just correction. But I just want to mention here that, you know, yes, certainly, you know, you, you give a lot more credit to me or to anyone else. Uh, it's just you're inspired by your own work. Uh, essentially. So, so I commend you for that. Uh, uh, and I'm just going to, you know, open this for questions, but I do have a lot of questions actually, uh, which just kind of sprung up, but uh, we'll discuss it right now. Let's take advantage of our audience who are here in person. Uh, and then you could go to, you know, to Dr. Lisa Newho first. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, well, thank you very much. It was an interesting talk. And, you know, I think artificial intelligence is like a wave of the future. And um, you know, I was reading about how that's being used for developing bugs and disease and developing early detection markers that we wouldn't normally be able to see with the visual eye. But I wanted to ask you, you were mentioning in there about using anti-VEGF treatments, um, Lucentis and... Um, Advasta and, and, and stuff, and how that can also work, not just with AMD, but with diabetic retinopathy, with the blood vessel work. Are they doing anything over in India uh, with trying the uh, gene therapy uh, AAB vectors that drive expression of the monoclonal antibody fragment for VEGF, anti VEGF? And that way they do these in vitro injections, and then it has a continuous expression so that it doesn't die off so they don't have to come back into the clinic you know was it like once a week however often so frequently and hopefully the expression will maintain for a number of years and um, there's a couple of them out on the market um, I was just quickly looking that up one of them is at Advertum by Advertum Biotech and the other one is this um, A5 or 7 which is by Regeneron and those I think they're in clinical trials yes in phase three that's right but i was it just occurred to me that you know that might be something too if you could participate in some of those trials okay yes sure but in india it's not there still but even that it's now still not approved because it's not proven its efficacy and its safety so i think the clinical trials will definitely uh, that's what they're waiting for. yes that's yes sure. so there is a question or a comment by melissa and the group Food insecurity and food deserts have contributed for the diabetes in the U.S. Food insecurity and food deserts. Yeah. Yes. Is this the case in India? I think so. I think the problem is everybody is moving from the staple diet to a, a modern diet, the so-called modern diet. And I think they want to take the fast food. And somebody would term the fast food is the cause for diabetes in India too. And that's because I think uh, they are in a hurry. They don't cook themselves. And that's what is the... Uh, problem. And I think that's why I said if you detect diabetes early and you can teach them how to eat a healthy food and also, and though in India it was a stable diet. They were using little millet, quinoa in the past and I think uh, unfortunately the rich said, oh that's only for the poor and that's how the whole thing changed and they are going for the modern diet with fried stuff and increasing the diabetes and also the lipid. So I think uh, in olden days it was a carbohydrate rich diet but it had uh, low uh, fat also addition to that. So it was a balanced diet, which is now missing. And I think uh, my grandmother lived 103. I can't believe she was not hypertensive, not, not a diabetic. Having, uh, she was eating rice and we call the sambar made of dal, that is a protein, and then vegetables, which has all the natural ingredients. And I think three times a day she had, and she was a vegetarian. So anyhow, I think the diet is an important thing. Stress is the, another important problem for diabetes and then diabetic retinopathy happens in one third of them and that's what the newer study was saying earlier it was one fourth now it's becoming one third so i think prevention of diabetes is the best and then then prevention of retinopathy 
Any other questions from the audience? And I can see Dr. Radhika is there. Uh, Mr. Michael Chetam is there. Uh, if if there are no questions here in the audience uh, in this room, if there are, if there are no, no questions, questions here, here in this, there are no questions here in this room. Uh, we can go to the audience on the screen. So uh, please uh, let us know if you have any questions for Dr. Natarajan. Anyone? I can see Dr. Radhika Krishnan. Uh, thank you very much for your work, elegant work, uh, Dr. Radhika ji. Any, any question? Any comments? Yeah. Any comments? Uh, hi. Yeah, hi. Am I audible? If not, I have uh, another question. Um, so last two years have been, you know, most people have essentially been glued to uh, working from home or uh, have not done a whole lot of movement and uh, or have been confined to with the lockdown and all those things into the various parts of the world have uh, handled and have been affected differently. But uh, most people have sort of, you know, been, have had limited uh, movement. Do you expect to see, it's a real public health question, Dr. Natarajan, do you expect to see uh, a rise in the incidence of diabetes or, uh, and therefore diabetic retinopathy in the next few years? Yes, that's what they, all the studies are projecting. And if you don't take action, it will increase and it's going to double. And India will and two other institutes with the uh, Case Western University, headed by Dr. Sudha Yengar and genetics Dr. Madhavan and Dr. Rajiv Raman, where they are comparing diabetic retinopathy uh, with uh, diabetes for 15 years, and diabetes with 15 years and no retinopathy, and finding out what's the problem. And similarly, our institution and uh, Case Western, we are making a new project where we want to write an, uh, our own grant for that to do a find out same and with a different, uh, also in addition with anemia and doing in slums of Mumbai. So we want to screen 5,000 patients and find out the difference in the affluent people and in the poor people, and also go into the demographic details and the food, what they eat and genetic study. So we are planning for a five-year study, but as you know, even to make a biomarker, maybe it will take seven to eight years to analyze. And so it's going to be a, beyond our life to work on this uh, research. I hope and multiple groups are working on it. You may have also put this up on the screen, but how well does anti-VEGF treatments work for controlling the angiogenesis in diabetic retinopathy? It works very well. That's why compliance is required where the patients have to come and the DRCR study uh, that uh, .NET has published that if you give monthly injections for a pro uh, late proliferative to a proliferative, you can prevent the uh, uh, so the new need for laser and you can have the vision stabilized so that you can clear all the neovascularization. So gene therapy, you know, provided that it works well, would, would predict that it would be a benefit. Yes, yes. By the way, Dr. Natarajan, you just mentioned uh, uh, one of our grants, the NEI grants, Indo-US program that is being run on diabetic retinopathy between the collaboration between Shankar Netrale in India and Case Western Reserve uh, University here in the U.S. And Dr. Lisa Newhold is the program director of that. Yes. So uh, she is the one who uh, has everything to do with the program. Uh, so I'm glad that Dr. Newhold is here uh, in the audience. 
audience. Sir, uh, there is another comment asking, do you see diabetic retinopathy screening move to the physician's desk any soon freeing up ophthalmologists in India uh, as in UK, etc. I'm not sure because that's the biggest problem in India at least. I don't know about the US. It is still not mandatory for an endocrinologist, diabetologist, general practitioner who's treating diabetes to send the patient to a eye doctor for retina evaluation. There are a few diabetologists who are keeping diabetes as a retina camera and taking a picture and sending. So that's the answer, but uh, it's not happening. I don't know what to do. I'm addressing the Association of Physicians of India, General Practitioner Society. And I think uh, it is like uh, uh, you have to keep uh, uh, trying. And one day, I think you, yeah. this, you, you have to break ties. I have a question on your uh, public policy um, in India. I, you know, I mean, I really admire all the efforts that you have, you and your team has been leading and doing things not only in Mumbai but all over India. And I know you are also very well connected uh, uh, around the world, especially in Asia. Uh, do you expect that uh, any sort of uh, any change in uh, health policy, public policy that your Ministry of Health or, or, or some other ministries of health? I think it, uh, Singapore has just published uh, with Team Wong because right. the Singapore government has taken it seriously. Right. That's what I, I think they have already screened out 100%. Dr. Paisen in uh, Thailand has made a big issue, but they are not able to screen with Compared to Singapore, Thailand is bigger. Right. And uh, they are also, I think they had a problem of using the uh, AI in a remote place because the uh, internet issues were there, so they couldn't manage. So he's finding a newer solution. And I think uh, and uh, in Vietnam also it's happening. But the problem is it's all happening in bits and uh, parcels here. But I think it should happen as a, like Singapore. Like the Singapore government has taken it as a, right. a policy to screen every diabetic. And in some small place, they have 10 centers. So I think every district, every state in the, each country should do, do it on their own. And it will happen. Yeah, Singapore is actually a very good example. And the work you just cited from Dr. Tian Wong, who is also a very uh, big supporter of NEI programs, uh, clearly has uh, given us a lot of insight into the uh, public health ophthalmology. Okay, very good. Um, any, any other question um, here? In that we are just coming up to closing time. We have time for just one more question. Anything here? Alex, you can ask question too. <laughs> Good. All right. Good. So, so one, one point which you told how India can play an important role in the global data standardization in the future of ophthalmology, clinical practice and research. I think that's, that's, the, that's the key. That was my question yesterday. That's right. So yeah. I put it. Okay. So I think that's the key which we want uh, I mean, it's going to really, uh, we, we, I think there are centers of excellence which are doing that, but it has to become a national policy, I hope. And that's what, uh, in my interaction with uh, Sudha Engar for the last few years, she said, the data collection is there, but the data quality has to improve and also to clean the data and make sure we have the robust data. And that's what we are addressing now, even though the RO grant, I think June 5th is the last date and she's going to apply. So I have decided we'll start in June itself from the Indian side with our own local, uh, so that whatever we are aiming at, we'll do it to set an example. Already Shankanetla, Arvin, Elvi Prasad, our Indian Institute is doing, and we'll be the one to join, and few more. And uh, BIRAC has got, uh, in Indian rupees, it is 10.5 crore, I don't know how much it is, or $1 million, uh, uh, I think, yeah, $1 million, where they have given uh, six institutes, to create, set up a clinical uh, uh, de, de, uh, de data registry for diseases on retina now. So we are working on it. So Dr. Azad is the advisor and six institutes, including Chitrakot is uh, included. So we are developing, and then this has to become 30 in the next phase about three years. So that's what we'll have robust data. And I think we will also contribute to the global data. Very good. So, uh, so I just heard that you're your team or consortium is uh, uh, is looking to submit an NEI R1 grant. Yes. Just make sure to take advantage of that 
new hold is here in person, you spend a few minutes, she might be able to give you some ideas. good uh, experience of good insight um, to uh, what to keep an eye on um, these, these things. And the NIH regulations are just, uh, you know, sometimes it can be overwhelming, but uh, very easy to navigate through business with the program. Sure. Definitely, I'll do that. And I, uh, we, I just want to recognize Eric Kim, who's a second year medical student in Brown University. So that's my mission again, my visit to US to be, have people, young people to work with us. So I'm glad yesterday also I met another resident from LA and they all want to do something back in India. Eric is uh, no connection with India except me. And I'm happy he's already working with us and publishing. I just connected him to uh, the D lab in MIT where they're also working on some devices to screen diabetic retinopathy with the Swami Vivekananda Ayurvedic Institute in India, which our prime minister is uh, supporting. So I hope something will come up in the next few years, which will contribute to the good health for people and good vision. Apart from the real physical vision, they also should be a visionary to prevent blindness. Thank you. All right. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, and I think we have come up to, to, to 2 p.m. here. Uh, and uh, some of us are going to stay in this room. Um, and you know, if there are more questions, we can certainly take the opportunity to talk. But on behalf of NEI and NEI director and the whole team, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Natarajan for his uh, excellent talk, his visit to uh, physical visit to NEI, and really appreciate and admire the kind of things that you uh, do, uh, not only in India, but all over the world. And thank you for all your support and work that you have done for, uh, with us and which you plan to do in the future. So thank you again. I think we're gonna conclude this uh, presentation here and we'll remain in this room for, a, for an additional about 15, 20 minutes. Thank so you. Thank you all and good night to the rest of the world and good evening to this part of the world.